is Mayor Mark Smiley, and he is a fellow Kiwanian and, and helps a lot with our meals and different things. And so, with a welcome, let's welcome Mayor Mark Smiley. Thank you, Melinda. Welcome everyone again. The, uh, I already introduced my wife here, so I'd like to uh, say thank you to my wife and all my family members that uh, support me as being the mayor. It's not the easiest job to take home every night and be the mayor. Uh, politics uh, come into play. And so when you're in politics, it does affect your whole family. So we, uh, my mother is not here today, but I thought she would be. I don't know where she's at. She's probably busy. But she always asked me, kind of like, you're not really going to run for mayor again, are you? <laughs> and I says, well, of course, because I love my job, you know. So um, anyway, I can't complain because every time I do, my wife says, well, you asked for the job, so don't complain to me. <laughs> so I'm truly honored to be here. We have a great city here. And this is my eighth year already being the mayor, and time flies when you have fun. And when you think eight years, you don't think much about it. But my son was in grade school when I started to be the mayor. He went through middle school, and he's going through high school. He's graduating this year as my term of mayor. So when you look at that longevity period, a lot of water is going over the dam, literally, for where we've come and gone. And where Brian was giving us a history lesson, where me, myself as the mayor, I want to go forward in the future. I don't want to go backwards, but we do have the history we relate to. So a lot of things have changed, and as a veteran mayor, I've experienced a lot, but every day I uh, meet new faces, I see new concepts, I learn more ideas, I network with as many mayors in Indiana as I can. There's 120 mayors in Indiana. There's soon to be 121 mayors because Fishers is going to become a city. So when I became mayor eight years ago, Andy Cook of Westfield was the 120th mayor. And out of that is a history lesson, as I will repeat this, out of the 121 mayors, there is one mayor who is a mayor of a town in Vernon, Indiana. And the reason the legislation appointed him as a mayor because they always ran that town as a city. So we have 120 mayors of cities and one, well, 120 and one of uh, town. But anyway, I would like to thank all the elected officials, board members, city employees, and all my department heads for the team I have with the city of Rochester. It's been going on seven years now that implementing my strategies of business and restructuring my ideas in the city that we are now, I compare it to, we are a well-oiled machine. We work together well. The boards, we've got all our boards in place, the city officials that are elected. We have a good team with the city councils and most of the other boards are appointed by the mayor or part of the boards are appointed by the mayor. It depends on the um, statute of the political part of it. For example, the park board, that's political. You have to have two Democrats or two Republicans or an independent. So there, therefore, you choose the people that uh, support you in your ideas and your concept of being the mayor. And as far as uh, then the, the attorney here, we appoint him as well. And uh, of course, everybody needs an attorney today. So Andy's on board with me there too, is backing us up for the city. Also, like I said, this is, uh, I'd like to thank the telephone company for being here, Rochester Sentinel, the paper that does our coverage, which used to be the Shopper's Guide, and also uh, WRI as well. We're very fortunate we have all three, four of these uh, entities in the city of Rochester. I still believe that business is the government of the people. When I came into politics eight years ago, I was never really into politics other than my own political business of being politics that way, of business. I, I've known many of you people, uh, everybody here, not everybody, but most of you I've known through my own uh, upbringing here in Rochester, Indiana. And when I became the mayor, I looked at it that we have a great hidden secret. But then I've met 
the 120 other mayors that have the same hidden secret too. So we're all competing for economic development in the future and we all want what's best for our cities. So we all have the same issues and that's one thing nice about uh, networking with the Indiana Association and Cities and Towns which I feel it's very important to do the networking because you stay in Rochester and you know you're in a enclosed bubble I would say but by networking with the other mayors I get to see what's going on with the other mayors and what works and what doesn't work last year I was the president of the Northern Indiana Mayor's Round Table which the state has broken up into four classifications you got the North Mayors and I'm the furthest city south to the North Mayors so I'm with the Lake County Mayors up there I don't know if that's good or bad but uh, everybody knows of the Chicago area politics but anyway we, we learn a lot from each other so that's been uh, giving me quite a, um, a challenge and an opportunity to move forward with some of my decisions that I, we make with the department heads and everybody else also uh, <clears throat> one thing I see in the vision looking forward hopefully we can keep and continue being the mayor here in Rochester. I'd like to see in the future a council of youth like we have the Council of Aging. I'd like to see something dedicated in the future either through private uh, funding or whatever we can get with grants to help the young people of Rochester have something to do. Um, I know we're a small city and we need to uh, focus on our young children growing up so they have things to do like play basketball inside all year long or do other things like that and keep them out of trouble which uh, not everybody gets in trouble, but we do have a meth situation in Rochester that we want to direct our youth in the right direction. And, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> by doing this, we have to look at the quality of life. The quality of life is a big topic throughout the state with the mayors, that quality of life is the seed for economic development. If you do not have quality of life in your cities, you do not have the opportunity to grow and bring people in here. And in today's world, we're a global society that you can live here and work anywhere in the United States or abroad with the computer technology we have today. So by having quality of life here, by having the parks or the um, uh, place for uh, youth, which would help bring families here to live. We have a nice community. So by having different things for our youth to do, this can uh, maximize the quality of life to bring economic development here, to bring people to live here and work elsewhere. A friend of mine works in uh, California and he lives on uh, Country Club Drive. So that's just one example. And by having the quality of life also that I would like to see in the future that the water and sewer be taken to 31 south down 25 it's already right there at the edge of town but if we get it past the bypass in the future with 31 coalition of the unlimited access of the highway that is going to happen eventually it's not going to happen tomorrow but it's in the plans to make that unlimited access and if we get the water and sewer over there with private development money and also whatever we can do in-house with the city that will expand into economic development when I went to these meetings for the 31, U.S. 31 coalition that I was looking at it just the safety. I was thinking shallow minded. But the governor was at the meeting and he said he was going to plan on getting this done in his term. What done is, I don't know how he's interpreted in that, but the uh, NDOT, uh, which is Indiana Department of Transportation, Deputy Commissioner who is new in Laporte just stopped in my office the other day and the internal governor, governmental affairs uh, representative said that it's going to go through legislation this year that right now they're out of money but they're going to finish the projects they've done. They've done the Hamilton County, then around Howard County, Kokomo, and they've done up at Marshall County in Plymouth and South Bend area. Those are all done. Well, eventually they're going to connect the dots and legislation has to go through the legal procedures where they're going to get the money for the motor high, highway vehicle fund. So we're waiting to see what happens in legislation. Somewhere they're going to have to pull money into it. Well, the state is has a lot of money, $2 billion, whether they pull from that or not. But <clears throat> that's what we wanted to be proactive in, and I'd like to see that happen in the next few years to get ready to have economic development there. Also, um, I would like to uh, go through a few things that we have done. That the uh, 
<clears throat> Rochester Redevelopment Commission, which uh, Ken Richardinsky is one of our, I think you're the newest board member on that board now. Terry Lee with Fedco, when he came into the office, he stepped up to the plate and became very vibrant with the Rochester Redevelopment Commission. It was stagnated for several years and it just was there, but Terry has taken this and moved forward and also by spinning off with Fedco that uh, we also have the downtown retail merchants activated again so that's up and running and we're looking at getting grants to help downtown right now through okra which is a, a grant to do the study to uh, better the quality of life of downtown rochester and we all know that we've got some blighting areas downtown that uh, buildings and things but we also have to go in the direction and if we don't try positive thinking and looking forward we won't get there <clears throat> so if nothing's ventured nothing's gained also, I'd like to uh, go into uh, a few things that we've done in my uh, strategical planning of uh, Rochester. <coughs> that uh, we uh, created a position through uh, through natural attrition several years ago, and we made uh, <coughs> an operation manager supervising job for all departments: water, sewer, and tr um, wastewater, water, and street. And we combined those three department heads into one person. And Warren Lease is my operation and supervisor, and he's been with the city for 20-some years. This, this has proven to be very effective. Not only is it effective, it saved about $100,000 a year in expense money for salaries and benefits. And we've done this about six five, six years ago. So that's a half a million dollars we saved just with that strategical move. And I did that from my contracting experience. I only need one person to go talk to as far as to run those departments for the infrastructure. And then he has plant supervisors and plant foremans under him that relate to him. So we all work together, but it, it just minimized the uh, expenses, which has really worked out well. Also in the last year, and we've uh, updated all our lift stations throughout the city. These have been uh, just, you don't see lift stations, they're buried underground. When I was in the contracting with Burton Mechanical, we said we buried all our mistakes because you don't see them. So when the lift station's underground, you don't see them, but you only know about them when they fail. So we've gone through and we've been proactive and we've gone through and redesigned and uh, put new pumps in, new pipes, and new electrical controls in all our lift stations throughout the city in my tenure. Also, we just purchased, and we've done this with cash as well. We also purchased a uh, Aquatac truck, which is a vacuum sewer truck that cleans out the sewers when we have backups. You know, you, everybody's fine. You don't think about sewage until you have water backing up in your house. Then you, then you call and you want it fixed. So we just bought a $330,000 Aquatec truck off of a local salesman who works for Brown and Equipment here, and we paid for that with cash as well. We rebuilt one of our clarifiers, which was built at the wastewater plant in uh, 1988, and that's been almost 30 years ago, and you're supposed to rebuild them every 10 years. Well, we just rebuilt one last year, and we have one now that we're going to be working on, the primary sludge digester. That was put in in 1955. That's old because that's one year older than myself. So that's uh, 59 years old. Got that, Tom? Got it. Okay. <laughs> Also, uh, the wastewater, uh, we've uh, started, we initiated having auctions again. Uh, John Garrett is one of our uh, local uh, Board of Works, Public Works and Safety. And he's also one of our councilmen. He holds an auction once a year and we liquidate all our assets instead of trading them in. And we've done really remarkable well how much money we've made more than trading in this old equipment to people that, uh, you know, are in the business to make money when you trade them in. For example, our wastewater vector truck, I told, uh, just for a suggestion, I said to Warren Lease, I said, I will probably get $2,000 for it. It's just an old truck. And we had an auction. Somebody bought it for $12,000. So somebody wanted that truck, and so we got 10 more thousand dollars than if we would have traded it in because they didn't want it traded it in. So the, uh, <clears throat> the other thing we've done, too, uh, we're in compliance with the wastewater department. We spent over a million two in the last few years at our wastewater department and we paid for that out of cash as well and we're not raising our water bills or our sewer bills as of now we do have to tweak them a little bit we had to do that we had to catch up they weren't raised for so many years but we have tweaked them over the past few years but we're still below average of water and sewer throughout the area in the state so that's a a, a great thing we also have 
over two million dollars in our wastewater department depreciation fund cash that's there in case we need it and our water facility we have two million dollars plus in that as a reserve too so we've done really well as far as uh, squeaking every penny out of the dollar we can do y yes you can always try to do more with less is what we try to do in the water department we did pay off a bond and we did that to get a better credit rating because we had in the works to build a new water tower. We know we put this new water tower in out on East 18th Street. And by doing this, we did purchase another bond for 3.1 million, I believe, right in that area. And by doing that, we also had enough money in that bond to upgrade a lot of our water plant and put new telemetry in there. So basically now we can run the water plant from your home watching TV on a laptop computer. I mean, that's the technology we have today. The other thing when we first came in in my tenure, when we started, we used to read our water meters by hand. We'd, we'd go out there and we'd go in and read them. It took three men five days. Well then years ago, we did put all electric uh, not electric, but censored meters that have a remote device that you can read them from outside of the house. And we thought that was really good. And we had these readers and we downsized that to about one day for two men. So we cut out all those days for man hours. Now we have a new type of system that we just purchased. And when you walk out of the city hall and you get on the computer, we can read 270 re meters right in the city hall parking lot. So now we're looking at two hours to three hours once we get this done to read the city water meters. I mean, that's a lot of money when you talk about the man hours. So uh, with the telemetry and everything in the uh, water plant, it's been a remarkable upgrade and technology is just so amazing today. Also, uh, I give my compliments to uh, Randy Wynn. He, he is our foreman plant operator for the city uh, water department. And also Lenny Conley, he is our uh, foreman for the street department. He's been with the city for 20 some years. And a lot of this uh, we did implement last uh, year um, with the background of I pushed a lot of snow in my day in the contracting business. So we were kind of restructured how we removed snow from downtown. And I told the guys, I said, I want to be able to eat off the curbs with no snow on there pretty much. So what we do is we purchased a, a, a Bobcat with a, it's a, like a Bobcat truck. It's a utility vehicle. And we got a, a brush on the front of it and a snowblower. I saw this down at IUPUI when I go to the uh, Mayor's Institute. They do that at the college campus down there. And I thought that could be really nice if we purchased one of those for our wastewater um, department because we can use that when we load our tools off and drive around the wastewater because we have several acres out there and you put your equipment in that bed of that bobcat and drive around and then that way you don't have to leave big heavy tracks in the grass and stuff when it's wet because the tires are wider and everything <coughs> else. So by Buying that, we also implemented it in the street department to brush the snow downtown off the sidewalks. Because what's happened in the past, we'd clean the streets and then everybody clean their sidewalks and throw it right back in the street and you never get the curbs clean. So we get up and two o'clock in the morning, the street department guys get up there, they're willing to do that and they brush the snow off the sidewalks and then they get it off the curbs. And then we purchased, last year we purchased a snow pusher for the big front end loader. And like I said, I pushed a lot of snow in my day in my contracting business, and by using that snow pusher, we put it on the front of that <coughs> loader, and we can push two or three blocks at a time, and it just minimizes the time of the snow removal. And you, you haven't <coughs> noticed how clean the city is downtown for all our business. And also, I think that the business downtown warrants having that done because we want to bring downtown we want to bring people downtown to do business. And that's what our downtown, our heart is there. So we want people to come downtown. And if the snow's not cleaned off, they're going to go elsewhere <coughs> to other areas. So that's been a big thing that we've done. The biggest thing we have a problem now with is trucking it out of there. We get them all piled up, but we got to get it trucked out. Similar to the farmers, they're so big now they can't get their grain harvested to get it to the grain mill because they, they can pick it, but they got to truck it. So <clears throat> that's been an interesting uh, concept and it's all been working out well. The other thing with the snow removal that uh, we have done and we purchased uh, four wheel drive one ton trucks and we started doing this 
and we last year we purchased three more of them and they're one ton trucks with a dump bed and we put a snow blade on the front of them they're much more agile around the lake and the cul-de-sacs they do a much better job um, i've always been telling them to put the front blades on because the belly blades on those big trucks when it gets really deep they don't push the snow out and it just sits there on the curbs and the street gets narrower and narrow so with these trucks they don't get stuck like the big trucks as well so even though those big trucks you think they don't get stuck but they can get stuck on an inch of snow if they try to back up and they can't move because they don't have that front wheel drive assist so that's been really working out well for the street department and uh, also uh, the uh, we've spent $350,000 on uh, paving the streets last year. This year, we've got a, a budget item of $400,000, which was okayed through the state. When we do the budget, we have to send it down to the state, which is the Indiana Department of Finance. They review it and they tell us whether <clears throat> we're exceeding our uh, uh, money that we're gonna get through the tax levy. So we always try to ask for as much as we can get and they're gonna tell us and sometimes they take it off. This year, they didn't take any money out but we'll see where we're at when once we get the uh, amount of the tax levy that we're with the circuit breaker uh, taxes that we get 1%, 2%, 3% from House Bill 1001 several years ago that there's a limit of the money that we get on the way they restructured the taxes. Also, we have been catching up with a lot of the paving that uh, over the years, it, it went by the wayside because as we all know, we tried to build and we did build a nice, beautiful fire station. Well, that money, a lot of it came out of the street budget because that was the budget that always got hit. So our streets started looking worse and worse. So we're trying to catch up with repaving. Uh, I think we, now we've got the whole lake done again, and that hadn't been repaved since the sewer was put in back in 1987. So uh, I remember it was that time because I was the inspector of the wastewater vacuum system when it was being put in. But uh, so we're moving right along the, the building that we end up getting through the county over on uh, First and Fulton Street. Um, we know that it used to be the Forest Farms building. We've converted that into a city building for keeping all of our equipment in there. And we, it's almost about, a, it's, it's quite a large area, half a block or whatever. And we take the millings when we do the um, asphalting of the street, we keep all our millings instead of let the contractor have them. So we use them for paving and we put the, uh, well, it's not actually paving, but it makes it when they warm up, it's kind of like a chip and seal. It makes it where you can have parking on it. So we pretty much did that whole ground around that uh, building on first and Fulton and made a parking lot out of it. And we still maintain our alleys this way. We take everything out and we use those millings in the alleys. So that's been really working out well. We also, uh, I'd like to still thank Andy Holland and the probation department. We still use a lot of probation people. This saves us about $60,000 a year by using uh, what I call free labor because they have to do community service. So we have them double up with our street department and they also work together and that minimizes our cost for the street department as well. The other thing I'd like to uh, thank uh, Chief Schatz for being here. He stepped up to the plate as the police chief and he's been doing a great job patrolling with his officers and keeping our city safe. And, you know, the structure that we started, uh, I know that, uh, as uh, Chief Schott said the other day, that uh, we implemented a program the other day to start documenting our warning tickets. And it appears that we're pulling a lot of more people all over, but we're actually not. We're just through uh, Chief Schott's uh, expertise here that we give them a written warning so we have documentation in-house if you get a written warning for speeding it's just trying to tell you to slow down or whatever because if you get several warnings of course then you'll probably get a fine but a few years ago we bought this sign that's out there that uh, flashes when you go by too fast and I know uh, Tom Bear always slows down when he sees that uh, sign as well and myself even if you're speeding or not it makes you slow down but that's why it's such a uh, higher um, vis visible uh, police warnings is, is because we're doing more documentation in, in house for our own records. And we also are uh, looking at purchasing a new uh, canine dog. Um, that'll be uh, canine dog number two. And uh, Chief Schatz recommended this. That way, um, w the way the police department works, you know, they, they pretty much work four 10 hour days. So this way we'll have a canine dog on call 
all the time, not on call, but on duty, because one canine officer will have it in the front of the week, and then the other canine officer will have it at the latter part of the week. And these dogs are a very good tool for many things, so it's, um, it'll be a nice asset to the city to get that done as well. And the uh, police calls were 9,554 calls last year. It's a lot of calls they take, and some of them aren't as important as others, but they're still calls. And uh, so they do a great job there for the number of officers we have. We are down to 12 officers. We started with 14 in my tenure, and, and we have 12 the way we've restructured. Also, the body cameras. The, this is, these are worth their weight in gold. I believe we were the first city in uh, Indiana to start body cameras. We've had them, I believe, Chief, for six years, uh, something like that. Seven. We're, seven. And we're on our uh, second generation of cameras. And this has all started because as when I, with the other mayors, I say, I'm a street mayor. I'm out there with the people. And I always get told, well, I didn't do this. I didn't do that. Well, that's when we started doing the body cameras. And you can watch the news, and a lot of cities wouldn't be in the trouble they are if they had those body cameras. So it's an investment for the tool, and it's worked out well. And I'd like to thank Chief Butler, uh, Fire Chief. He's done a, a remarkable job in my tenure as well. Uh, last year, he told me he had 511 runs. Now, these aren't all fires, but they're emergency runs for first responders and uh, accidents and a number of things. So um, he's done a great job with the uh, fire department. He's been very frugal on his budget. And he uh, last year, I think we took uh, ownership of a 10-year-old ladder truck, which goes up. We had a 30-year-old snorkel truck, which everybody says we don't need it because the building burnt down that was so tall. But out at the lake, it's so crowded out there that that ladder truck will extend out. So you can get between the houses and fight the fires rather than try to drag the hose in between the houses and take a lot more risks. So that truck's, um, if we wouldn't have bought a 10-year-old truck from, uh, I believe it's uh, Wayne's, Wayne's uh, Township. Wayne Township in Indianapolis, if we bought a brand new truck, it had been over a million dollars. So we paid $160,000 for this truck. And it's like brand new and they went through it. Also, we got a rescue vehicle last year, uh, about 330000 for the fire department. We upgraded our 20-year-old truck. So we've tried to do this over the years, and we've been paying with this all cash. We haven't had to borrow the money other than one truck a few years ago. We did borrow the money, but we paid it off. So we spent over a million point two on fire trucks upgrading the fleet in the last several years. Also, with the fire department, we uh, have merged, which we all know the ambulance, the EMS, is with the fire department. It's been working out really well. We've had a lot of bruises on the way. It's just something new that by housing EMS people with fire department, but it's working. Um, this year, with the county commissioners, it's the first year the EMS is in black. But we went back years ago. The county commissioners started the low-up funds, and that's what it was for, to start the low it funds to incorporate taking over ownership of EMS, the emergency vehicles for the ambulances. And by doing that, we donate some of our money or help pay our part. And so we house the EMS and the fire department. And the collaboration's been really well. But like I said, there's been some hiccups and bruises, but we've managed to get through it with uh, Chief uh, Butler's expertise on helping personnel of employees and everybody else. So. <laughs> The other thing I'd like to keep moving on here, I know we're running out of time, but uh, I know I have a hard time talking all of this stuff, but we'll try to move through this. Uh, um, Kendra stepped up in uh, Chadensky here. She's a member here, so I'll use your name while you're here. And um, a pat on the back, she's done a great job with the park board. And when I first came in, we, we pretty much uh, you know, it was all the golf course. The golf course is a great asset, don't get me wrong, to the city of Rochester. But if you look at the quality of life, we need all the parks to be great assets. We need them to be vibrant, we need them to be clean, we need them to be safe. And when we get in the safe part, um, getting back, bounce by one step backwards with chief shots, we've got all cameras up at the park now where we want them. Strategically, we got them in there to reduce vandalism and the safety of the people. Also, we put these cameras up in our wastewater department and areas, and all our water towers are under video. This is all for Homeland Security on that. So this has been a big step that we talked about for years of doing this, and then going to the park with Kendra and the other three board members, we've come a long way. 
a lot of cities have closed their swimming pools. This was a big challenge that the park board members took on this year, and I was all for it. You know, a lot of people say we don't want to spend two hundred some thousand dollars on our pool. Close it down. A lot of cities have closed their pools down, but it all comes back to quality of life. If you don't have quality of life for our young people, then why do people want to come here to move in our beautiful city? I mean, if not everybody has children. But we need to maximize what we can offer for our young people to attract the older people that have the children to be here, pay our taxes, and also, you know, by the money they make, the county gets some of that money too through the taxes. So it's, it's a great asset. If you haven't seen the pool, drive by it this summer and look at it. It looks like a brand new pool. And if you had to build a brand new pool, you'd probably be talking three or four million dollars. And we got it all done for about less than 250,000, I think. And we bought new furniture and everything like that. So that's a lot of money, but it's gonna last another 10, 20 years. So when you look at that, you know, it's a good investment, in my opinion. So, I mean, not everybody believes in what my opinion is. I've learned that through the years, but, uh, and I didn't realize how many people didn't like me until I became the mayor also. <laughs> But moving right along, the um, Lyle, he is he, Lyle Lingenfelter, our golf pro. He's done a remarkable job out there. We're very blessed. We have Lyle. Our city course is. Um, I, I'll put it up to any municipal golf course in the state of Indiana. A municipal golf course. Private golf courses, yeah, they'll be better, nicer. But Lyle does such a remarkable job with the funds he has, and he spends his time and life at the golf course and he's a very respected person and, and I hate to see losing Lyle down the road. I, I hope he stays here for many years to come. And also, uh, I'd like to uh, thank all our businesses who partner with Rochester and uh, either factories or businesses that we're very fortunate that we can retain the businesses that we have. Um, it's like, uh, you know, Rochester is a small city but a lot of us live here because we love Rochester. If we wanted to make more money, we might have moved to the city, you know, in different areas. But Rochester's got a lot of quality of life, and I think we're going in the right direction, and I'd like to see it keep going in that direction. Also, uh, I don't know, um, one thing I didn't want to go back to the police department. Um, some people say we have too much of a uh, aggressive police department. I disagree with that. When I came into being the mayor, I was pretty naive about the police department. You know, I was probably on the wrong side of the fence thinking how they worked and everything. But since I've been the mayor, I've learned there's two sides of that story. And it goes back to those body cameras that, uh, you know, I'll tell a little story when I was in the, well, I was in prison, but I was working there for Burton Mechanical in Michigan <laughs> City, so I want to elaborate on that. Um, we worked inside the walls with Burton Mechanical, and I was pouring the concrete and everything, and every inmate I met up there in the Michigan City prison, they were all innocent. Every one of them was innocent. So, but the thing of it is, the, the policemen have been doing their job patrolling, and that's why they do write a lot of um, warning tickets, because we want to people to slow down. A lot of people have asked me around the lake, have we got trouble around the lake because we see police cars out here now? I said, no, they're actually patrolling like they're supposed to be, not watching NASCAR at their buddy's house, you know, so they're not sitting up at the police station, they're out and about patrolling, looking for things. Enough trouble finds the police department without them looking for trouble. You know, they don't have to go out there and look for trouble. They might, I've had many compliments lately that they're pulled, somebody's pulled over and they just say, well, your license plate's out, just get it fixed, you know, but, you know, Normally, people are out there at that time of night, if it's 3 o'clock in the morning, that they might not be that lucky to be let go either. So I think overall, I, I'm really blessed that I have the team that I have through the city. It's taken, you know, six years to get there, and I, I, I still do all the continuing ed I can do. I go to May Mayor's Institute every three months. They started this in 2008. A lot of people will say, well, what do you do that for? Well, I, I think it's been uh, really helped me make a lot of my decisions and bounce things off the other mayors. And the, um, I always uh, kidded uh, Ernie Wiggins, who was a mayor in Warsaw. And several of you might know Ernie, but uh, I always told him he was my mentor. And, and he got to retire and he didn't run again. He was a CPA over there. And he, uh, 
I asked him what I'm going to do. He goes, you don't need any more help. So it was all good. So anyway, uh, I've met so many good, wonderful people around Indiana that uh, I'm really blessed that I was the mayor and I'm still in the mayor and hopefully I can continue to be the mayor. But uh, I don't know. I will take anybody's questions. If you have questions, I don't know how much time we got left. But uh, anyway, I can go on and on. And I think I covered everybody that's here. And Marty, I know he's doing a great job. And we talked to Marty to long time ago about being a council member and he's actually going to go again if he can mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's been a good team so anyway um, I'll, i'm open to any questions as long as you don't throw too many zingers at me i'll try to answer them so yes are there uh, any annexations annexations uh i don't see that there's going to be any in the future um near future because what's happened it's it's hard to annex places once the infrastructure's gotten in the ground. This was tried to be annexed, take Fort and addition out there before I came in here. In order to annex, you've got to get almost 60% 60, 60 of the people that want the annexation. Um, I'm not going to say that we can't try, but when I first became mayor, I wanted to annex everything around the two-mile buffer zone again, and there was a, a late gentleman Pete Terpster, who passed away. And he um, came in, he says, well, you can annex, but by the time you spend $2 million running all the amenities out there that you got to do to get them to come into the city, you're only gonna bring $15,000 in tax money. So it's not a good investment if you're gonna put two, $3 million out there for storm water, sewer, electric lights. So the uh, downside of that is that it's just too bad I can't go backwards in the history because if that would have all been done in the, some of those developments out there by Kirk Concrete and that, if that would have been done before they built houses, they could have annexed it back then. They do have water and sewer, but uh, I don't see in the near future that it's going to be an issue unless we could get something done, like I said earlier, to get the water and sewer out by 31. And if we get the landowners before it gets developed to annex that, that would be a great shot. See, we left, we left just down the street from Kirk there on the Right. Down. Okay. So, so we have the benefit of it, but we don't pay attention. And I, honestly, I think that's wrong. Yeah. I think we should. Right. Because we, we benefit from that right. service. It's but too bad it costs so much to, to the other. yeah you've got to have all the amenities there i mean it's just you got the water and sewer mm -hmm. the storm water is an issue the street lights would be an issue but um then you got to look at the return on the investment so uh unfortunately i wasn't the mayor back then so right. yes i have a little bit of conflict with what you said which if the city's charging what they should for sewer and water you're paying your share to a, point, to a point, because it takes longer for the people to go out that way. See, they passed a law, which we haven't implemented here, but I hate to get into all this, but I will. they passed a law that we could surcharge um, people that don't live in the city for water and sewer to make up the difference because it takes your people longer to go out there. It's not much, it's minimal, but what's the opportunity cost if they're not driving all the way across town to do it where they'd be right in the city? We haven't implemented that yet. I'm not saying it will never happen. I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball, but it's minimal. But we still have to repair those pipes and everything like that. And I guess in that way, we don't own the streets in your area. The county does. So it's kind of a, you know, it's, it's a little different in one way than I know you're from RMC, so it doesn't really matter where your electric goes to a point, but it, um, that would be the only difference that would be it just take longer to get there. And, you know, you need more manpower, but it's like we don't own the water going, we own the water going out the acumen, but we don't own the pipe. We never accepted that. So that's another issue that they, that was a, they, they started a Richland Center Conservative District to oversee that water line going out there. So any other questions? Well, being from RMC, I'm retired now, being from RMC, we, we serve whoever is wherever. Right. And it's the same price. Right. But that's built into the rates. Right. This is an average rate for right. everybody. Yeah. And it's built into the rates. It's similar. And, and, the, and the water and sewer should be the same way. Yeah, it's similar, but uh, it's just that you can't change the dynamics of county and city. You know, I mean, it's just... <laughs> It's, uh, 
want to say there's always uh, pros and cons. So I go back to the part that I didn't know I had so many enemies until I became the mayor. <laughs> <laughs> it's politics. Steve, you got to have a question. You let me down if you don't have a question. You, you always have I took one. Good notes, Mark. So I'm also. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak here again. I uh, was on the radio with uh, Tom Bear today, given uh, what I talked about. It was after the council meeting, but I thought it was been really. Uh, a good great idea to do the nuts and bolts I call it you know being a contractor we talk on the radio try to once a week and a lot of people uh, I think appreciate that and like I was telling Tom I said it's only my eighth time here where did time go you know so anyway I appreciate being here and I thank um, WRI for being here RTC the newspaper and I, I don't see anybody from the paper here but uh, anyway I'm very fortunate that we could do this and I hope that I can do it again next year Thank you.